Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, and in this episode, we explore the poetry of Catullus. Catullus is the most difficult of the Roman poets to wrestle with. For one, he is mostly a mystery compared to his contemporaries and successors like Horace, Virgil, and Ovid. We simply don't know much about the man and his biography. Moreover, what poetry of his survives sometimes comes across as obscene in a way that not even Ovid or Horace come close to matching. Of his 117 surviving poems, even recent scholars have considered a third of them unworthy for reflection. Their obscenity speaks for itself. Yet Catullus is the creator of Latin elegiac poetry. His lyricism is unarguably breathtaking and witty, especially in Latin. And he was an individual who sang of what Christians would later identify as man's fallen nature. That tension between love and lust, compassion and hatred, joy and envy. Catullus, then, may be the preeminent poet of the city of man, but his poems also move with the spirit of a restless soul, seeking the nourishment that only love itself can provide. After all, those who have any familiarity with Catullus will remember him or know him as something of a love poet. I hate and I love. Why do I do so, perhaps, you ask? I do not know, but I feel it. And I am crucified, Catullus says in poem 85. This short poem encapsulates the totality of Catullus's poetry. Love and hate, confusion and torment, desire and guilt. In two lines, and two lines is the entire poem, Catullus poetically summarizes and manifests the human conditions, many twists and turns. Catullus lived through turbulent and transformative times. He lived and died during the nadir of the Roman Republic. He counted such luminaries as Cicero, Crassus, Pompey, and Julius Caesar as his contemporaries. He made fun of them all, at least to the, to the degree that he could without losing his life, and occasionally having to apologize to stay in their good graces. He was, in this regard, somewhat courageous, taking on the Roman power players during the Republic's terminal decline and descent into civil war and empire, which he did not live to see. In this chaotic time, as we all know, he fell madly in love with Lesbia, Claudia Metelli, wife of the Roman politician and counsel Quintus Metellus Seller. His love for Claudia and witnessing the real-time decline of the Roman Republic fueled him for his most memorable poetry, his love poetry to Claudia and his reflection on the decline of the ages, his famous bedspread poem, poem 64. It is, therefore, these poems that I will concentrate on and offer an appraisal of, an appraisal of Catullus's heart and mine, a heart that we too share, even if we think ourselves primer and more proper than Catullus's fantastical imagination and own tumultuous life. When Catullus wrote those words, I hate and I love, he spoke true words about the human condition. While one can say that it was also a manifestation of his own life, specifically his failed love life, which saw Claudia fade away from his bedside clutch, and that no other woman ever held such prominent place in his heart, the agonized love and lust, which Catullus speaks of in his poetry, is something that philosophers, theologians, and writers of the past and the present have wrestled with and continue to wrestle with. We all intuitively know that this agonized love, this trepidatious line between joy and enmity, 
is something deeply real, as we all have experienced it in our own lives. Catullus then speaks to us in our most hopeful moments. He also speaks to us in our crudest and darkest moments. This is what makes Catullus lively and repulsive simultaneously. We are him in our most hopeful moments and our darkest. The tension between love and hate is not merely found in the love poems to Claudia. This, that tension between love and hate, is the central theme of poem 64 as we slide through the myth of the ages toward decline, the impossibility of love and the agonizing heartbreak of having fallen from that primordial grace of blissful existence without suffering the broken heart of a lover sailing away from our lives forever, causing us that great distress. Poem 64 opens with the memories of an Edenic-like paradise, Arcadia to the Romans, with its picturesque depiction of nature, which also evokes the goddess Minerva. They say the pines were born long ago from the head of Mount Pelion in Thessaly and swam the sea, its undulting waves, to Phasis, Pheasant River, and the land of Etius, the king. The poem begins with this depiction of serenity, this wonderful pine-filled forest of Mount Pelion, and the joy of the marriage between Peleus and Theotis, father and mother to the great hero Achilles, more on him later. In the wedding banquet, Catullus ignores the story of Pseudo-Apollodorus, where the goddess of discord, Eris, was excluded and tossed the apple of discord into the banquet, which caused the goddesses Minerva, Juno, and Venus, Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite, to war with each other and demand a verdict as to who was the most beautiful. Instead, Catullus depicts the wedding that everyone yearns for, for. Pure love, joy, and the bliss that comes with wedding garments and songs. Catullus's opening of the poem is a wedding of pure love and joy, the very imagined wedding that most of us hope to have one day in our lives. It is the ideal within the ideal. However, the wedding of Peleus and Thetis give birth to the heroes most admired beyond measure of all ages, yet quickly descends from that golden age into decay. The place that was filled, he writes, with the jubilant crowd who held gifts before their faces and faces expressing joy is subsequently contrasted with the imagery of uncleansed soil and fallen leaves polluting the fields causing decay to overrun the abandoned plowshares. The hour of happiness is also the hour of declination. The poem shifts then to the story of the heroes, Theseus and Ariadne and Achilles. The myth of the ages asserted that the decline from gold to silver to bronze was given a brief respite in the heroic age. The heroic age brought new life, new inspiration, new vitality to the world of decadence and destruction. Here, Catullus brilliantly subverts this portrait and continues with his own fall of man in the continual decline of the earth and humanity. The heroes do not bring new life in Catullus's poetry. Catullus's continued progression of the bedspread poem inverts our expectations, as well as implying the tragedy of love and the sorrow and hate that comes with a love unfulfilled. Peleus and Thetis should now enter the bed to consummate their love with each other in the rapturous bliss that comes with marriage. This was the hope of Ariadne, who can be understood to be Catullus in real life with Theseus, sometimes considered to be Claudia in real life. Ariadne's dreams of marriage to Theseus are shattered when the hero abandons her 
and sails away to Crete to meet King Minos, and eventually set sail for Attica, where he will slay the infamous Minotaur that enslaves the people there and become the mythical hero king founder of Athens. But the concentration on Theseus forgets Ariadne. Catullus includes, in brief, Theseus's feats, but he concentrates on the lament and sorrow of the woman spurned and abandoned by this Greek hero, her heart fading into oblivion, her tears cascading down her cheeks like a torrential waterfall, beaten and broken by the false promises of love, which causes enmity between the sexes. The loss of love causes her to be pitiful and alone on lonely sands, which shatters her hope for a happy marriage, dancing under the stars with those longed-for wedding songs. Here, Catullus, knowingly or not, speaks truth about love and the lack thereof. Love binds together, as we saw in Peleus and Theatus, irrespective of Catullus's intent. Love initially bound Ariadne and Theseus together. If love binds together, and that is the unitive force that holds all things together, the opposite of love is separation. Separation, then, leads to loneliness. The loss of love for Ariadne results in precisely that, separation from Theseus, which results in her utter isolation. She is alone, as Catullus writes, on lonely sands. As Ariadne watches Theseus sail away, her heart still desires to cling to him, a reflection of her still unquenched, though dying love for the hero, but is now completely lost, reminding us of that isolation and loneliness that comes with love unconsummated. The raging passion in her heart leads to her famous lament. Ariadne's lament is a heartfelt plea, a curse really, directed against Theseus with significant implications. She curses him and his false promises, which extends into a more universal statement of enmity between the sexes. May no woman now believe a man where he makes a promise. May no woman hope for the words of her man to be true. We grieve for Ariadne because we too know the loss of love and the heartbreak that comes with it. Ariadne's sorrow and lament reveal her love, but it also reveals that hate which comes with a love spurned and rejected, the hate that causes enmity, quarrel, and war, the hate that Catullus spoke of when he said, I love and I hate. The other great hero that Catullus subtly inverts and critiques is the hero Achilles, the child of the love between Peleus and Thetis, which the poem began with. Catullus's critique of Achilles is the perfect continuation of the imagistic language he has crafted with the abandonment and the tears of Ariadne. The loss of love that Ariadne has succumbed to is now met with the imagery of bloodshed and destruction as Catullus launches into, into the infamous rage of Achilles, where he storms back into battle and the final days of the Trojan War, and causes the Scamander River to flow red with blood. For as a reaper picks thick bundles of corn, Catullus writes, beneath the blazing sun and harvests the blonde fields, so Achilles will lay low the bodies of the Troy born with unforgiving iron. The river's commander will witness his great virtues as it flows in profusion with slaughtered bodies that mount up. Catullus is satirical about the great virtues of Achilles here. What great virtue is death and destruction? None whatsoever. Having witnessed the sorrow of Ariadne's abandonment and lament, this sorrow of love lost turns into the imagery of death and destruction with the pivot to Achilles itself a metaphorical continuation of the death and destruction of the love lost by Ariadne and the love lost we all experience in our own lives. Catullus is magnificent in the dialectical progression 
of how the loss of love leads to death, and he does so with a piercing satirical critique of the greatest hero of antiquity. Achilles is no hero, just as, Theus, uh, just as Theseus is no hero, at least from Catullus's critique within the poem. The arc of poem 64 is the gradual decline from the golden age of Arcadian bliss and serenity to the sorrow of love spurn, to the death and destruction that results because of the impossibility to find happiness and solace in love. This is the age we now find ourselves in, according to Catullus, notwithstanding the fact that Catullus himself was unable to consummate the burning love of his own heart. Moreover, where the heroic age was generally conceived and imagined by Catullus's predecessors and his own contemporaries as a time of reprieve and inspiration, Catullus subtly implies that it was yet another continuation in the decline of humanity. So now, as he says, the gods have turned away from us, so they do not dignify our assemblies with their presence, or even bear to touch the clear light of day. What begins in a serene and joyful opening, Arcadia, with a wedding banquet, moves to heartbreak, sorrow, death, and destruction. Poem 64 follows the myth of the ages, but Catullus inverts the heroes and heroic age as just another path on the decline. It is a lamentable age, an age of, bet of betrayal, deceit, and skullduggery. The heroic age brought grief and death, not respite and new life. Those who worship the heroic age blind themselves to this reality the sorrow of Ariadne, the bloodthirsty rage of Achilles, and a death that came from love spurned and rejected. What a depiction of the fall of man, all things considered. Beyond the bedspread poem, Catullus is most famously remembered for his love poems to Claudia, as hitherto mentioned. It is easy to dismiss these poems as the ruminations of a man-child who never grew up, a lovesick puppy, angry that the love he sought was not reciprocated, that the often obscene language that he uses is sometimes, according to the critics, a warrant in of itself for rejection. Yet such a dismissal of Catullus's poetry misses the profound insights that Catullus speaks of about the turbulence of love and lust, and the dream that love can last forever. Love has the power to unite and bring serenity in a world of flux and violence. This is true when you read all great poetry. It transports us back to that original, Edenic, Arcadian paradise that we have fallen from. Our language today, like Catullus's language then, still evokes this ideal in love. Claudia is the sparrow and the apple of Catullus's eye. Their love is like the Libyan sand, kissing and caressing each other on the golden beaches, with the soft waves of the ocean crashing up around them. The experience of love always seems to take us back to that primordial garden where love was first sanctified under the skies of purity and the tree of life. However, like Catullus, we often realize that this is the very language and the very ideal that so much of our culture has always imagined. How often, like Catullus, do we see in our culture, literature and film especially, romantic moments under the sun, the moon, and the stars, just as Catullus imagined him and Claudia kissing each other on the Libyan sands with ocean crashing up around them, how many of our great films have those exact moments of love depicted between the lovers in their films? Perhaps the most famous is, of course, the great film with Burt Lancaster, From Here to Eternity, where the lovers are seen kissing 
on the sand, with the waves crashing up around them. How often, like Catullus, do we have our own experience of love in the blessed meadows and fields of nature? How often, like Catullus, do our own sacred traditions evoke Eden, gardens of delight, and blossoming flowers as the pasture in which love is most fully realized? But all that glitters is not gold. Catullus, being the man he was, was also attuned to the madness and the chaos, the ecstasy of love turned to lust. From those same images of sparrows and apples and grains of Libyan sand, Catullus also speaks of loosening chastity belts for a thousand kisses and another thousand that causes him to go crazy and become a fool and a failure. Here, too, Catullus reaches into the dark id of human existence and its libidinal desires that can lift us into that Arcadian paradise of blissful love or tear us down and drag us into the abyss of hate, cruelty, and anger. As Catullus says in one of his poems, Lesbia says a lot of cruel things to me in front of her husband. The dolt finds considerable happiness in this. Mule, do you have no feelings? If she had forgotten me and kept quiet, she would be cured. But since she barks and abuses, not only does she remember me, but this is far more piercing. She is angry. This is how it is. She burns and she talks. Like many lovers, Catullus employs an inverse psychological justification of how taunting and teasing and cruelty is itself often a reflection of love. The madness of love, really lust, which drives us insane and often is the catalyst for abuse, is precisely what Catullus is speaking of here. Lesbia always speaks badly of me, Catullus writes. But in that speaking badly of him, the lovesick poet interprets these moments as evidence of her love. I'll be damned if Lesbia does not love me. How can I tell? Because with me it's just the same. I curse her continuously. But I'll be damned if I do not love her. Catullus's juxtaposition of the serenity of love with hate, cruelty, and anger is also something common in our cultural patrimony. How often, like with Catullus, do we see in our culture, literature and film especially, lovers quarrel with one another, strike each other, and engage in cruel teasing and mockery that sometimes results in physical confrontation? How often, like Catullus, do we know people in such relationships where things seem romantically ideal at one moment then horrifyingly terrible in the next. How often, like Catullus, do our sacred traditions also depict the tension between love and hate burning up in our own souls and hearts, the temptations and turbulence that comes with the restless heart seeking love while fighting against the death impulse of lust. Catullus may not have had the understanding of lust in the way that those who came after him did. But we have the benefit of living in the aftermath of those writers and psychologists and thinkers who were able to separate the bliss of love, which Catullus correctly identifies with the serenity of that primordial perfection long lost, from the destructive anger, anger and danger of lust, which Catullus wrongly associates with love, but still speaks powerfully of in its base impulses and manifestations which would make Freud nod in agreement. As such, we can see in Catullus the twists and turns of the temptuous soul caught in the rapturous vicissitudes of life, seeking that love which is the love of bringing us into that serenity while simultaneously being drowned in a torrential whirlpool of our own libido dominandi. We see in Catullus our own personal struggles and hopes, our vanity and ego, our failures, 
and our want for redemption. Catullus's love poems sing of this common mortal condition we all inhabit. If love is the calming medicine of the soul that brings unity and serenity in the midst of death and destruction, a union of two become one, Catullus still glimpses that reality so powerfully and so beautifully for us. As he writes, You dangle before me, my love, and life, the prospect that this love of ours will be cherished and last forever. Great gods, make it that she can promise truthfully and say it sincerely from her heart, so that we may live our whole lives together by this everlasting pact of sanctified love. It would be a great injustice to our own lives if we discard Catullus simply on the grounds of his crudity and pedomorphic antics and language. Yet have we not ourselves cried the same feelings of Catullus, the same curses of Catullus? Have we not been caught in the same ecstatic torment of love and our want to consummate it and the grief and sorrow of love's failures? Have we not ourselves cried out to the heavens for sanctification and for those dreams of living a loving life in a garden of delight to come true? If we run from Catullus, it is only because we see too much of our darker selves in him, while remaining blind to those wondrous moments of the light that break out of his wicked splendor and lift us back to that original bliss we yearn for, the love we all seek, the love that Catullus himself sought. Catullus is not a saint, this is true. He is not a moral poet. But his crudity and madness still dance with the shadows of truth and echoes with the cry of the human heart. Catullus is entirely right that we should cry out to the great gods so that those whom we love can sincerely declare truthfully from their heart and out of this declaration of love, two lives will come together through that pact of sanctified love that will last forever. Despite it all, Catullus is right to see love as life. We should live, my lesbia. We should love. Only in that love do we experience the calming heart of joy that gives us a taste of eternity. For all his many faults and ills, Catullus still glimpsed that serenity of eternity offered in love.